Dr. Jeff Orge. Dr. Orge is the president of Gateway Seminary. Gateway is a seminary, of, uh, it's one seminary, five locations, and an additional online opportunity. Uh, Dr. Orge is going to speak today on leading major change in your ministry. And we're, we're going to hear from someone who's not writing about it and speaking about it on an ivory tower, but he has led the major change in various settings. Uh, he has led the major change in, as pastor. He served as pastor in Missouri and in Texas. Uh, he also led the major change in a church plant. Uh, he planted and led Greater Gresham Baptist Church in Gresham, Oregon. He also led major change as an executive director of the Northwest Baptist Convention, where he served for 10 years. And he's now uh, leading the seminary and has led in major change at Gateway Baptist Seminary. Uh, Dr. Orge is married to Ann. They have three adult children. They have five, he has five grandchildren. He turned his computer on. One of them came up and brought his day, I know. And uh, so we're uh, Dr. Orge has written a number of books that you may have read, seven I believe total. The most recent one is the one that you received a free copy of today. But he's also written the painful side of leadership, the character of leadership. Is God calling me? By the way, uh, church leaders, if you are wanting to help put a resource in the hands of someone who may be considering the calling of God on their life, is God calling me? It's a great resource, among others, that he's written. Case for Antioch talks about uh, the characteristics of the transformational church. So, great resource as well. Dr. Orange uh, has always been a person when I have listened to him, either in person at a conference or online. God has always spoken to me and helped me in a practical, helpful way through his teaching ministry. Dr. Orange, thank you in light of what we're experiencing in our day that you took the time out of your schedule. And you came to Kentucky to be with us. And we welcome you gladly to speak to us today. Right. Thank you for letting me be here today. Only one direction. I didn't take time out of my schedule. This is what I do. I love doing this, and I love being with guys like you who are frontline leaders in God's team, and particularly those of you that are lead pastors right now. In what is, in my lifetime, the most challenging time to be a church leader that I've experienced, so thank you for what you do. I'd like for you to uh, open your Bible to Matthew chapter 9, where in just a moment I'll be showing you how to use a passage of Scripture in this context of leading major change. And let me uh, just say also thank you for your support of Gateway Seminary, your gifts to the cooperative program, your prayers for us, and sending us your students. And this is not a seminary commercial day, but if you have any questions about Gateway or how to access anything we offer, Globally or locally, uh, just check with me after the presentation today, and I'll spend all the time needed to help you get connected to our school. Well, today, my task is to teach you about leading major change. And here in the introduction, it was referenced that I've led major change in a number of contexts. The first church I pastored, we relocated. The second church I pastored, I planted. And after several years of that, I uh, moved to be the state executive of the Northwest Baptist Convention. I'm delighted the church I planted is today the largest uh, church, largest uh, Anglo church, maybe the largest church. I think the Romanians might be larger downtown Portland, but uh, in, the, in, the, in Oregon, Southern Baptist Church in Oregon. So it's thrived now for 30 years, and I'm so delighted about that. In, uh, in the Northwest Baptist Convention, on the day of my election, the board went outside and had a groundbreaking on a new convention facility, and we relocated the convention and moved into the 21st century in a lot of different ways. And then, of course, in 2014, I announced the biggest major change that I've ever led, and that is we relocated Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary 400 miles to Southern California and rebranded ourselves as Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention and started an entirely new era of theological education in the Western United States. Now you, pick, you think about that. We picked up the 10th largest seminary in North America, faculty, staff, students, library, computers, files, everything, 
and moved 400 miles over the summer of 2016. And today the seminary is thriving. I can't even describe to you how strong we are and what God is doing through us. And it's because of God's grace, the cooperative program, and our seminary's visionary unity to move into the 21st century that that's possible today. So uh, thank you for your support. And thank you for letting me teach out of all of these experiences today. Now this seminar is not on how to move a seminary, so just relax. Uh, it's on the principles I've learned over 40 years now of ministry leadership and over these four key instances of leading major change. Now today, in the next two hours, I hope to accomplish three things. Number one, I want to give you briefly, in the first 15 minutes or so, uh, an overview of a model of how to preach and teach on leading change in your ministry context. Uh, when you address this in a church context, you need to do it from the Bible and from a biblical perspective. Now, a lot of what I teach today rests on the foundation of that. It, of course, moves beyond that, but nevertheless, it rests there. And you need to be able to articulate you know, some principles of change directly from Scripture. And I'll just give you one example of how to do that today. And then we're going to talk about two things that emerge out of the book. Second, today, we're going to talk about the diagnostic model for determining when your organization, your church or organization, is ready for major change or needs major change. And then third, I'm going to talk about uh, what happens when people go through major change, and that is they go through what's called transition, and I'll teach you what that means, and then one focus on one component of that. So I'm going to teach you really about two chapters out of this book that you've been given today and let you read the rest and reflect on it, not try to overview it or anything like that, but instead go more deeply into, the, into these sections. Now when we get to this third part about transition, I'm probably going to go off script just a little bit today because I also want to talk to you about what's happening to you right now. Because the kind of major change that I'm talking about is the kind of major change that leaders initiate. But what's happening to us right now is that major change has been thrust upon us in at least three ways. The pandemic has thrust major change upon us. Social unrest has thrust major change, major change upon us. And the current and coming political turmoil in this country geared to the election is thrusting major change upon us. Now, the principles of what happens to you and how you are responding are the same as for your followers. You're no different. Welcome to the human race. And so I'm going to talk with you about not only what you can do in helping lead people through transition when change comes upon them, but then you need to be reflecting on what that means for you today because you're going through the same thing. Does that make sense? So we'll be personalizing a little bit more in those contexts in the third part of the presentation. We're going to go straight through the noon. If you need a break, get up and take it. Don't worry about it. You're not going to distract me. I preach through crying babies and yelling at protesters and people walking down. It, it, it all happens. So you go in the bathroom, so I'm going to bother me. You need to step out. All right? Uh, some of you are saying, yeah, I've been there. All right. Okay, you know what I mean. So let's start by talking about how to preach and teach for major change. And one of the passages I like to use to do this is Matthew chapter 9. If you look with me here, I'm going to, obviously, you will say, what about the, oh, uh, I'm sorry, two more quick things before we get moving here. Um, uh, if anybody wants these PowerPoints, I'll leave them with the uh, conference leaders and they can give them to you if you want, that's fine. Uh, they're not that dramatic, but they're helpful. But the second thing I want you to know, that I definitely want to tell you, you've been given a copy of Leading Major Change today? All right. Here's the deal on all my books, not just this one, all my books. I have zero interest in making any money on books. Uh, so I will, for any of my books, if you as a conference participant want to use them in your ministry setting, if you'll email me, we'll get them to you at the author's price, which is about 50% off of retail. Now there's one caveat, you can resell them. Okay, you have to use them by giving them away. And I trust you to do that. But all you gotta do is email me and my sister will it's easy. We'll just work it out with you. And you send us a check, we send you the books. It's like it's that simple. Uh, and that's on any of my books uh, for use in your ministry settings. So if you want to do this book study with your deacons or your elders or your church leadership council or somebody like that, get it from me. If you just need one, get it from Amazon, all right? But if you need 10, we'll help you, all right? Because we can help you quite a bit with the price break when you start getting up into the numbers. All right, here we go. In Matthew chapter 9, we want to talk about how people respond to change. <clears throat> Let's look at the Bible for just a minute. Starting in verse 9, the Bible says, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. 
While he was reclining at the table in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came to eat with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now when he heard this, he said, It is not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests be sad while the groom is with them? The time will come when the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now, this is three short vignettes, and quite frankly, when most of us preach from these, we preach about what Jesus said in the interactions perfectly fine. But these three vignettes are sort of run together in front of two of the most significant statements that Jesus made about change. Notice what they are. Verse 16, no one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. And no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the skins burst. The wine spills out and the skins are ruined. No, they put new wine into fresh wine skins and both are preserved. Now for years, I taught this passage of scripture and focused on uh, the illustration of the garment and the wine skins. And I'll talk with you about that in just a moment. But I was always puzzled why these three vignettes, as we would say in the New Testament class at Gateway Seminary, why these three little short stories are sandwiched in front of these teachings on change. Of course what Jesus said in the interactions is important, but then I kept asking myself, but why are they put together like they are right in front of these two teachings on change? Did it? Dawned on me, came to me. I like to think that even God led me to understand what this is about. Here's what I discovered. These three incidents show us how people respond to change. First is the Matthew model. The Matthew model is very simple. Hear Jesus, follow him. Don't you wish it was just that simple? Uh, I mean, don't you wish it was just that simple? And man, don't I wish it was just that simple. Uh, and in some ways, it is that simple. Uh, at the bottom line, that's what we're trying to do. Hear from Jesus and follow him. But the next two stories illustrate the two different kinds of people who, who struggle with change. The next group is the Pharisees. What was the Pharisees' problem? The Pharisees' problem was too much was changing too fast. They came to Jesus and said, Jesus, hang on a second. We've spent centuries perfecting these religious rituals related to hand washing and food preparation and consuming meals. And you threw a dinner party and obliterated all of it in one night. That's too much change, too fast. Jesus, you need to slow people down. And take this a little more uh, carefully and a little more slowly. You ever heard that in church? <laughs> too much is changing too fast. We need to go a little more slowly. We need to move it at a better pace. This is the Pharisees' problem. Too much is changing too fast. And then this next group, John's disciples, what was their problem? Well, John's disciples, their problem was uh, not enough was changing fast enough. They came to Jesus and said, Jesus, well, first of all, who were John's disciples? These were the followers of John the Baptist. These were the early adopters. They heard John the Baptist preach. They started following him immediately, and they were very, uh, and they were then willing to become Jesus followers. Now, remember, there was no Twitter, thank God. Uh, no Facebook, no Instagram, no social media, no email, no instantaneous communication. So John's disciples were slowly as word was getting out, becoming followers of Jesus. You track how this was going on? But once they started following Jesus, what did they say? Hey, Jesus, you people need to pick up the pace. What's wrong with you? We're fasting. Your people aren't fasting. Jesus, you need to quit the program. Not enough is changing fast enough. Ever heard that around the church or a ministry organization? Now, I believe these three stories are right before these two great principles about change because they help us to preach and teach on how people respond to change. The goal we're all striving for is to be like Matthew, to hear Jesus and follow him. But quite honestly, most churches and ministry organizations are full of Pharisees and disciples of John. Some who are saying too much is changing too fast, others who are saying not enough is changing Enough. And we often feel like we're riding a bumper car careening between these two extremes trying to connect with everyone who's struggling with change. 
Now, when you preach and teach on this, be careful that you don't make yourself the hero. You're not always one of Matthew's model. You're not always a Matthew model person either. Every one of us can be a Pharisee or a disciple of John depending on the issue. Right? For example, in 1973, the American League introduced the abomination known as the designated hitter rule to the great game of baseball. And since 1973, the American League's been playing Fair League softball while the National League's been playing the great game of baseball. And now this summer, the commissioner has obliterated those distinctives, uh, those distinctions, and we're all using the designated hitter, and it's almost, it's almost beyond my capacity to watch. You're thinking, you've lost your mind. No. When it comes to baseball, I'm a Pharisee. I want it played just like it was played in 1919. <laughs> it's, who's it me to? You said, I love it. Give me a little hair because I'm right there. There you go. I like it. Okay. I like your shirt. Foster hope but not love, but keep baseball pure. That's fine. <laughs> What I would encourage you to do when you preach and teach on this is find your own illustration of something that you personally have struggled with because it changed too fast, and then something that you personally have struggled with because it didn't change fast enough, and identify with people and help them understand we are all in this together. Because one of the things that leaders make a mistake in doing is, by, is attacking people about their either resistance to or embracing of change rather than identifying with people and recognizing we're all in this together. All right? So when you're preaching and teaching, this is one passage. Of love. Then Jesus, of course, moves to these two great principles. Jesus said, no patches. Now, you have to explain the illustration a bit, but in verse 16, no one patches an old garment with unshrunk cloth because the patch pulls away from the garment and makes the tear worse. Major change means what? Major change. No patches. Now, you'll hear me say this perhaps later in the morning, but I do not need major change every week, month, or semester in Gateway Seminary. Major change happens rarely in an organization. Incremental change is what most of us need to be experts at leading on a daily basis. I lead incremental change. I have a meeting every Monday with our executive team, and we talk about what we need to fix, what we need to improve, where we need to go, what we need to do. We're always making incremental change. But Jesus said, sometimes, sometimes, a patch won't do. Because if you try to patch an old garment and you wash it, the tear will be worse than the beginning than the problem originally. And that's why sometimes, you guys, sometimes you have to have a new facility. You have to have a new location. You have to have a new budgeting format. Sometimes you have to change your Sunday school from a Bible teaching to a discipling or a discipling to a Bible teaching or a discipling Bible teaching to an outreach organization. Sometimes you have to move from a Sunday school to small groups or small groups to Sunday school. Listen, I'm not advocating for any one of these. I'm just simply saying that there are times when incremental change will no longer solve the issues at hand and major change is required. So Jesus said, it's okay to patch an old garment. It's okay to have an old garment. It's okay to make do for a while. But there comes a time when a patch won't do that's what happened at my first church. We, we had a building that seated 150 on a good Sunday. Five years into the process, we had two worship services and chairs in the aisles and no place else to sit down. No hope for expanding, no way to go larger. And we realized we patched, manipulated, worked that, and found solutions for 20 years on this property, and now it's over. It was time for a new facility. Make sense? Okay, no patches. That doesn't mean every day you have to lead major change. It means most of the time you're leading incremental change, but there does come a time when you have to say no patches. And then second, and this is the one that you're more familiar with, of course, the wineskins illustration, and that is major change requires new structures or new wineskins. Now, new structures are new holders. You know the illustration of the wineskin. I don't think I need to belabor it. Most of you know that illustration. You've got a wineskin, an animal hide pouch that holds alcohol, 
wine ferments, it expands, you use an old pouch, it ruptures, you lose everything. Everybody understand the illustration? Okay. Jesus said sometimes, or he said, major changer, the real change requires a new holder. Now, this can be a little bit confusing when you think about a holder or a structure. So let me just say, this can be a budget, it can be an org chart, or it can be a facility. It can be any of those structures. For example, at Gateway Seminary, if I have a meeting and I say, we're going to make a major change and launch this new program. The questions that come are, what kind of money are you allocating? What kind of personnel are you allocating? What kind of space are you allocating? And if I say, no money, no people, no space, then everyone looks back at me and says, there's no program. Because unless I'm willing to change the structure, change the budget, the org chart, and the building, the program's not going to originate, right? That's why you have to, you know, in church, if people say, oh, yes, we want to reformat our missions program. And so you sit down and start redoing the missions budget, and then they say, wait a minute, we can't do that. But we said we're going to, we have to change the structures. So when you preach and teach on major change, this is one passage that you can use to do, the, to do that. And when you preach and teach on major change in this passage, you can start by saying, here are the ways that we respond to change. Here, Jesus followed him. That's the purity of the model of what we're trying to accomplish. But quite frankly, most of us are either Pharisees or John's disciples, depending on the issue. Explain the Pharisees, explain John's disciples, and then give illustrations, perhaps personal ones and impossible humorous ones, like the designated hitter rule, of how you struggle with either being a Pharisee or a disciple of John and how you come through that in some situation in your past to give people encouragement that yes, it's possible to struggle with change a bit before you finally get to where you need to be. And then you can teach these two principles. Major change means major change, no patches. And major change means, means new structures, which means we have to change in our context, budget, org charts, and space if we're really going to make a change in how we implement something in a ministry organization. Okay? All right, let's just stop there. This is one model or one example of how to preach and teach on change. Now, if you read the book, you'll see that while I don't think Joshua conquered Jericho, so I can know how to move a seminary, I don't think that's, and I say that in the book, but like the conquest of Jericho is an example of a major change, and how the people took over the land is an example of a major change. And you can go all through scripture and find examples of major change, and so, Pick the part of scripture that you feel most comfortable explaining and preaching and teaching from and develop messages from that that help people understand what you're trying to do or why you're asking to make this major significant change. So far, so good? All right, let's shift gears here. The second thing I want to do today is I want to talk about deciding when major change is needed. Now, when you read the book, you're going to discover uh, what I call a diagnostic model or a diagnostic tool that will help you do this. Now, I am uh, an intuitive leader, and I believe, uh, and am a leader that believes in seeking God's leadership and the spirit of God's direction in my life. And I believe most of you are that as well. In the context, though, of being intuitive and seeking the Spirit's leadership, I've created what I call a diagnostic tool to help you lead people and an organization to think through the issues related to change. This doesn't diminish the sense of your, uh, that you believe God is directing or leading or prompting it, and it certainly doesn't diminish the Spirit's leadership or power to work through you. But I've learned over 40 years now that Major change is usually a process. It's not something that typically happens instantaneously in a ministry organization. And so for people to be led to understand the need for and to embrace the, the, the opportunity of a major change usually requires some kind of process. And that's where this diagnostic tool I'm about to teach you emerged. So the diagnostic tool has five questions. I'm gonna talk about them in, a, in total and then I'm gonna go through each one for about 10 minutes each. So just stay with me, don't worry about writing all this down. Here are the five diagnostic questions. Let's read them out loud together. Ready, here we go. Is the change essential to the mission? Is there shared urgency about the change? Is relational trust high enough to sustain the change? Is the timing right for the change? 
And am I willing to see the change to completion? These are five diagnostic questions. Now you might say, well, how would I use these? Well, number one, you should use these privately in your own devotional time before the Lord. Where you're spending time working through these five questions before you even attempt to lead other people to, to or through this major change. Then secondly, you can use these five questions with your leadership team. Where you perhaps call together your deacons or your elders or your leadership team and you say, I want us to spend an evening or a weekend thinking through these five questions and talking them through about this issue of possible major change in our ministry setting. You can also use these five questions as a framework for creating the presentation you're ultimately going to make to your church or organization about the need for major change. <coughs> so these five questions in this diagnostic framework can be used privately for you to help think through whether you think it's time to make a change or not. And then as a group process to help a group come through to major change. And then even as an outline to help you format how you communicate the change to others. Now I wouldn't say you use this like ask the questions and answer them in the format, that's too wooden, but you get the idea that it's going to guide you in developing your presentation, all right? All right, so let's talk about each one individually. The first one, the issue is essentiality, and the question is, is the change essential to the mission? Now, the next slide is the most important slide today. You ready? Here we go. The only legitimate reason for major change, advancing the mission of your church or organization as it serves God's mission. The only, the only reason, legitimate reason for major change, advancing the mission of your church or organization as it serves God's mission. And there are other issues that confuse this. For example, ego needs of leaders. Our church needs a new auditorium because I want to preach in a bigger place. <laughs> Our church needs to be on TV so I can make a name for myself and get invited to speak on a conference somewhere. Our church needs to reformat its budget so I can have a bigger staff and people will think I'm more important. Am I cutting close to home here? Not in Kentucky? Okay. All right. Well, it's a problem in California. I don't know about the rest of the world. It's been a problem in my house. I've had to wrestle down with my own ego and I leading a major change because I want it for something that serves me are because I really believe it's because of God's kingdom needs. There's another one. Initiating change for comfort. Young pastor that I know fairly well, well enough that I could confront in a, in a snarky way. The pastor came to me and said, oh, Dr. Orge, we've been working on a major change in our church for some time. I said, really? He said, yes, we've been working to reformat our budget to hire an associate pastor. I said, that's a very big change. Man, sounds like you've really worked hard on it. Yeah, it's been a couple of year project to get everything in line to make that happen. We finally have a position in the budget and we're ready to start looking for someone. I said, well, what, what kind of person are you gonna hire? And he said, well, we're gonna hire an associate who can you know, take some of the workload off of me and, and, and really help uh, to do some of the things that maybe I don't really enjoy as much or I'm not really as good at. And I said, I hope you fail at that. <laughs> he said, excuse me? I said, I hope you fail at that. He said, well, why, 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 do you, why do you mean that? And I said, listen, I want you to have an associate. But if you're not hiring an associate to make your life easier, if you're hiring the wrong person, you have to hire an associate who will multiply your ministry, not divide it. Not take over some of your work, but make more work for you. Do you not understand, young pastor, that staff multiply your workload, never diminish it, and if they don't multiply your workload, you hire the wrong people? Well, his eyes got big. And I said, listen, go home, reform 
write the job description to be focused on reaching more people with the gospel, making more disciples, and expanding the work in your church, not taking workload off you, and then you'll be making a great use of the money. What was he doing? He was about to do what? Hiring for comfort instead of mission. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Too much major change about comfort. And here's another one. Initiating change that doesn't successfully address the mission. We need to pay the parking lot for Jesus. No, probably not. You probably need to pay the parking lot because that's part of the cost of doing business in a, co in a culture that has cars. Right? <laughs> now, you maybe can connect that in some way to your mission, but let's just be honest. Not everything has a direct one-to-one -one correlation to the mission. All right? Some things just have to be done. The life bill has to be paid. Let's just pay it. It's part of doing business in this culture, in this country. All right, you get the idea. These are some problems that cloud the issue. Now, before I go on, uh, the most I've been teaching this for a long time, a lot of places, and I get the same question over and over again. What do you do with people who, who are resistant to major change? Okay, what do you do about those people? Well, I'll talk about it at the very end again, but I'll talk about it right now, too. This slide answers your question. If your major change is essential for the mission of your church organization if it serves God's mission, then a person who's resisting major change is not really resisting change. What are they really resisting? Mission. And they have to go. They have to leave. Now, if you walk out of here and use this as an excuse to get rid of people you don't like, may God help you. That's not what this is about. This is about having honest conversation about the mission of God as it's expressed through your church or your ministry organization and finding people who want to share that mission to work with you and saying to people who have a different mission, we love you, we bless you, we honor you, but that's not where we're going. And we encourage you to find a place where you can give your whole heart to the mission that you really believe in. But this is our mission. And this is where we're going to make that mission a reality. This is not an excuse for divisiveness. It's a reality check on what we're really about. We're about the mission of God as it's expressed through our church organization. And when we're convinced that we understand that, and there's opposition to it, it's not opposition to the change, it's opposition to the mission. And you might say, well, what if the change really isn't about the mission? Then my question is, why are you doing it? Why are you wasting resources on frivolous change that doesn't have anything to do with the mission? You say, well, because I like that style of music better. I want to be more comfortable. Well, why are you doing that? Why are you wasting energy on frivolous change if it doesn't effectively address the mission? And if people are opposed to that kind of change, well, you just have to deal with it because you're wasting everyone's time making change that doesn't relate to the mission. Okay. I was with the preaching there. I'm going to calm down now. <laughs> a lot of people ask me, how did Gateway Seminary move 400 miles? And I'm standing here now five years later, and I have never received an email, a voicemail, had a personal conversation, or even a snail mail letter from any employee or student of Gateway Seminary in opposition to the relocation. Why and how did that happen? It happened for two reasons. One, the overwhelming presence of God to give us spirit supernatural unity. I confess that up front. But second, it was because the people of Gateway really believed the relocation was an expression of and a commitment to our mission. And they, their spouses quit their jobs. They all sold their houses. They all got new doctors new dentists, the kids all got new schools, and dozens and dozens and dozens of families went together 400 miles because we believed it was the mission of God for our seminary to do. If mission is driving change, those who can't go with you are opposing the mission, not the change, and you have to address that. Now I'm a pastor at heart, seminary president by assignment. 
I don't ever want to lose anyone. Ever. I want every member that ever becomes a part of my church to stay with me forever. But the hard reality is, if they don't share the mission, as you understand it, that God is calling you to fulfill in your community, you're going to have division, and you just have to face up to the fact that you don't share the same mission. Well, let's move on. Um, we won't have time for this today, but I hope that you have a mission statement for your church or ministry organization. A good one is one sentence. A one sentence statement of your reason to exist without any commas or conjunctions. If your mission statement has commas or conjunctions, it's not a mission statement, it's a listing of strategies. The mission of Gateway Seminary is we shape leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. Virtually everyone in Gateway can quote that in their sleep. We shape leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. You notice our mission is not theological education. That is not our mission. That is a strategy that we implement to fulfill our mission. But we shape leaders in the business office by making people pay their bill on time. We, we shape leaders outside the classroom, in the chapel, and in co-curricular activity, and helping people understand various aspects of what we're trying to accomplish in their lives. So it's not just educational and theological education. That's not our mission. That's one of our strategies. So I would love to spend the two hours with you on this, and in a different day, I might. But we, you have to have a one-sentence statement of your reason to exist. And if it has commas and conjunctions, it's a list of strategies put together by a committee, most likely. Not a distilled statement of why you exist. All right. Ours is shaping leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. Sometimes we say it, we shape leaders, but either way we begin, you get the idea. So that's, uh, and, and everything in, in our school has to answer that, and, and it's, it's not easy on that. And you might say, well, yeah, mission statement, that's just something you write. No, it's not. Um, when you really start using these tools, it starts changing your organization. For example, we, we bring this up often in meetings and gateways. We shape leaders, and everyone has the permission to ask, how does this proposal fulfill our mission? And they often ask the president that, and there's been a few times when I've had to say, okay, it does it, moving on. <laughs> It's hard to do that, and sometimes even I get caught up with some accountability on this issue. All right. Essentiality is the change essential to the mission. If the answer is yes, go to the second question. If the answer is no, stop. You're not going to make that change because it really doesn't have anything to do with the mission. You say, well, second question, urgency. Is there shared urgency about the change? Is there shared urgency about the change? Now, what do you think is the key word in that sentence? Share. You guys are smart guys. Yeah, share. Here's the reality. You're a leader. You see things long before anyone else does. When I went to my first church to be interviewed, I arrived at an airport. I drove on an interstate highway. I went off on a four-lane feeder road. I went off on a two-lane road. I went down the street and got on a two-lane gravel road, and we drove to the church. And I thought, wait a second, one mile from here is the intersection of two four lanes. Why aren't we located there instead of on this gravel road back here? During my interview, I thought, this church needs to relocate. Now, even though I was a young pastor, I was smart enough not to say that in the interview. I won't tell you that. <laughs> but even then, I could see, this isn't going to work for the long haul. Not if this church grows like I dream it can. See, as leaders, we see things a long time before everyone else. And we have an urgency about change because we're leaders. We, we, it burns within us to see progress made. But quite frankly, it's not always shared, is it? So how do we accomplish shared urgency? Well, to underscore how important this is, uh, there's a man named John Cotter, K-O-T-T-E-R. He's a professor at Harvard. Places. He wrote a fantastic book called uh, Leading Change, John Cotter. Uh, it's a book bestseller. Most female programs use it as a textbook. John Cotter has an eightfold uh, model for leading change, and the first step in his model is create shared urgency. He later wrote a second book. The second book, he said, after teaching my first book all around the world for almost a decade, I come to conclude I made one big mistake. I didn't put enough emphasis on urgency, even putting it number one. 
So he wrote a second book called um, the, A Sense of Urgency. A Sense of Urgency. And that book is all about creating what I'm talking about today, shared urgency. Now, I don't like some of his solutions because I think they're secular and maybe even somewhat, uh, well, I just say that I didn't, I didn't like all his solutions, but I did like his, his basic premise and some of what he had to say. So I'm giving it a different perspective in my book. Here's ways to create shared urgency. Number one, well, well, again, how do we normally do it? Well, we preach to people. You need to do better. You need to follow the Lord. We need to make this change. Well, I am all for preaching about these things. I've already given you a model for how to do it. But beyond that, and maybe with a little less irony, how do you do it? Four strategies. Number one, use accurate information about your ministry. Use accurate information about your image. Now, why is this difficult for leaders? Because some of this accurate information doesn't make us look that good. Now, I'm a seminary, special, a seminary president. We are specialists at spinning PR to make ourselves look good, okay? You, you didn't laugh at that. Okay, you're supposed to have laughed at that, all right? Um, we, we constantly are out there promoting our schools. We know how to do that. But when I come into a board meeting and into a leadership meeting at Gateway Seminary, it's not a day for promoting how good we're doing. It's a day for looking at the hard reality of what we are doing. And so we recently went through a long process at Gateway to think about where we're going for the next decade. We relocated, we restabilized in our new location, and then we spent 18 months or so working hard behind the scenes thinking about where do we go from now to 2030. And one of the hard things we had to do in that meeting was put real data on the table. I'll never forget one of the early meetings of the task force when one of our faculty members looked at this detailed enrollment report over the past several years and said, I had no idea this particular program was doing this poorly. And he said, we really, we really have to address this. Now, how do you think that would have sounded if the president had told the faculty, I'm going to address the closing or the altering of this program? There have been some resistance, right? But when a faculty member looked at the raw data, he said, this is unacceptable. I, I see that. We have to do something about this. That shared information created urgency for him. It is hard to look at real data, like baptismal rates by age, like giving patterns, and I don't mean just how much money you got, but where the money come from? How much of it came from people over 60, people over 40, people over 20? What's really happening in our ministry setting? When people look at real data, especially leaders in your church who believe in what you're doing, trust you, and want to go forward together, when they look at real data, here's what you'll find happens most of the time. They're going to reach the same conclusions you reached. Except they're going to reach it on their own and be telling you what needs to change rather than you telling them. Share urgency. And the risk of this, the risk of this is that some of these facts will not, not necessarily make you look good. But again, it's not about our egos, is it? It's about the mission of God. And if we have to put it on the table, this is what we've really done in evangelism, this is what we've really done in discipleship, this is what we've really done in missions, this is what we've really done in our community. Let's really look at it. It's a way to create shared urgency. Second, use accurate information about your mission and opportunities. Putting before people their true opportunities is another way to give them urgency to help them discover what can really happen in their community. Like, for example, if you were to say to your leaders, do you believe we should reach the people in our community? They would say, absolutely. But then if you were to say, well, do we know who is in our community? Well, do we? 
This is an old illustration, but it gripped me so much when I first heard it that I've been living on it now for almost 40 years. Are you with me? It's a 40 year old illustration that's been changing me all this time. I was in a seminary back in the day, and my evangelism professor told this story of what happened when he was a seminary student pastor. So this story is old. He went to a rural church in West Texas and started preaching the gospel and calling people to Jesus. About six weeks into his pastor, they had a deacon's meeting. And the deacon said, Pastor, listen, we love you. We think you're going to make a great pastor for us and really a great pastor someday. But you need to understand something. Everybody in our county is already saved. <laughs> we, we're, we're a Christian town, a Christian county. And, and you're preaching so zealously about salvation every Sunday, and, and the reason you're not getting much response is because people are just saved here. And he said, really? Okay, no problem. I understand. Thank you for helping me. So a month later, they had another meeting with me. He said, this time he had a map on the wall. And he said, here's this little star. That's our church. And I drew a circle around our church, about a five-mile circle. And uh, you know, we're out in the country, so I drew a five-mile circle. And I put a blue dot, or, or, or put a red dot on the map for, for every house that I can identify out here. And they're all like, okay. And he said, so you guys told me last meeting that, that everybody in this town is a Christian. And I, and I, I, you've lived here a long time, and I guess you're right, but I just want to ask for sure, because you know, we have an obligation if they're not. And they said, yeah, sure, Pastor. So Pastor said, so he said, so this house right here, who lives there? And one of them said, well, that's the Genesis. And then another thing he said, that didn't the Joneses. They sold that about 18 years ago, remember? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I remember that. They sold it moved down. Well, who lives there now? Okay, nobody knows. I'll circle that. About six or eight circles into the map, one of the deacons said, Pastor, I get it. I'll go with you and visit every one of those houses and see if we can talk to them about Jesus. And that year, that old rural church baptized 50 people. Because they went intentionally into the community. And what happened was the deacons saw a map that showed what was really happening in their mission life. And they were good men. These weren't recalcitrant, you know. These were good men. They wanted to do right. When they saw it, they said, we didn't realize. we got to go. That's what I'm talking about when I say sheer urgency by showing people what's really up, the opportunity that's before them. I remember when our church where I was a staff pastor was uh, next door to our church. The government announced they were going to build a large government housing project right next door to our church. Oh my goodness, the people in our church. Oh, the government is building a housing project next door. Oh, this is horrible. It's going to take the neighborhood back. Oh, it's going to be a mess. But the pastor, he got up and said, there's 225 units being built in a stone's throw of our standing right now. That's 225 families God is moving under our doorstep with you back with the gospel. And in that moment, by showing that as an additional opportunity, he changed the narrative in the church about what was happening in our community. And he started saying things like, who, who, who would like to create a strategy for reaching in? Who can think of a program that would go after that, their, their, their needs? What can we do as a church? Let's start thinking about that. All right. How do you create shared urgency? Accurate information about your church and accurate information about your missional opportunities. Third, fresh consideration of God's mission for your organization. How do you accomplish this? Through preaching and teaching. Through regularly reminding everyone what your mission is. Now, not every Sunday, but periodically throughout your year, there should be those Sundays when you preach and teach on your mission and what you're trying to accomplish and what you're doing as a church and what that means. And then finally, a legitimate use of crises both negative and positive. A legitimate use of crises, both negative and positive. Now, a, let's talk about a positive one first. A positive crisis moment. Well, uh, a positive crisis moment would be, for example, a long-time effective staff member leaves, and you have to replace that person. But rather than just dropping someone into the slot, you have the opportunity to take a step back, fresh consideration of the ministry's accomplishments, fresh consideration of additional opportunities, and to say, let's use this critical time of change, which is what a crisis is, 
Let's use this critical time of change to do something different than we've done before with this position. I'm facing that right now at Gateway Seminary. My vice, uh, I have a vice president that's uh, in just about 10 days, he's gonna be, we're gonna be announcing that he's gonna be moving on. He's been on the seminary for 35 years, okay? So it's gonna be, you know, we're gonna be making some transition. And, and it's a positive time for us. It's not a negative time, it's a positive time. So we're gonna be reevaluating and looking at all of this and making that kind of a critical analysis of where to go forward. You get the idea. Now, what about uh, negative crisis that come? Well, the best example of that would be, of course, the seminary. In 1959, the seminary moved to its location in Mill Valley, California, and had a 25-year master site plan approved. In 1984, that 25-year master site plan was revived, and 25 more years were added to the site plan. And when I became president in 2004, uh, the seminary was, uh, the board told me the master site plan expires in 2009, and we're gonna have to have a new plan, either revamp this campus dramatically, or we'll have to make some decisions about relocating. And we spent from 2004 to 2009 working on that problem, and we came back with a recommendation to stay. We did not recommend the move. And the board adopted a recommendation from the trust, from the, from the um, administration to stay. So we presented a massive reorganization, uh, excuse me, redevelopment plan to our county, uh, which involved us redeveloping our property, selling a portion of it, building homes. We had over 100 acres, so we were going to sell the homes, refurbish, rebuild, change the entire complexion of the campus, because this may surprise you, but education has changed a lot since 1959. <laughs> and we needed a campus for the 21st century, not a rehab one for the 18th century. And to put make a long story, which you can read the book very short, we ran into a political, legal, and community buzzsaw that made it very clear we were never going to redevelop our property. It just was never going to happen. And now we have a crisis. We have picketers in the streets. We have an organization formed against us, hiring our own land development specialists, our own attorneys, our own consultants. Uh, they are meeting with politicians. We are meeting with politicians. We hired the largest land use law firm in America to represent the seminary, and we went to war. That's a bad analogy. We went to battle legally with them. And by 2013, we realized we will never redevelop this property. And we were at a crossroads, a crisis point, a dead end, really. And it had, uh, it was the bleakest, darkest time imaginable. I, I can't even really put it into words. You can read it in the book. 2013. Excuse me, 2012, into 2013 was a bad year. Uh, I mentioned this in the book, uh, paid a high price physically, heart damage, other problems. Uh, at the beginning of 2013, I was advised by my position to resign my position. The job was tipping me. The seminary was a place where I knew that we were possibly going to lose one of the seminaries in the Southern Baptist Convention because we could not stay where we were and survive financially. It was not going to happen. It, it, it just couldn't be. We were in San Francisco, north of the Bay, richest county in, in California and one of the richest in the country. Cost of living unbelievably high. Houses across the street, the seminary sold for $1,000 a square foot. And these were houses built in the 1960s. Not new, not new construction, none of that. These are teardowns. They're called million dollar teardowns in California. You buy the house, you tear it down, you build a new one on this lot. Because you can't build on the new lots, you have to build an old one. This is where we were living. We had a crisis. And by the time April 1st, 2014 came, when I got up and announced the seminary, we were selling the camps, we were relocating. By this time, our employees and our students, they knew something had to happen. They could see the protesters in the streets. They could read the news articles. They saw the crisis. And when I stepped forward and said, and we have a solution, that solution was embraced because they saw it as the fulfillment of our mission. Okay? 
So how do you create shared urgency? Well, of course, you can um, preach and teach negative messages about trying to motivate people to do more, but I don't think that's going to help you much. So I think it's better to do these things. Share accurate information about your ministry. Share accurate information about your opportunities. Preach and teach about your mission and the possibilities of fulfilling it in your context. And then finally, pay attention to crisis moments. Positive, like staff changes, that's a positive crisis moment in the church. And even those negative ones that are thrust upon you, like a tornado comes through town, or a building image happens, or a seminary has to relocate because the town won't let you build anything. You get the idea. Share urgency. Number four, or number three. We're cooking along. Oh, we're doing great. Number three. Trust. Is relational trust high enough to sustain the change? Now, most of the time when leaders, or when we hear teaching on this, we focus on this sentence. Leaders must earn their followers' trust. And I certainly believe that. Okay, you must have the trust of your followers before you can go forward. Um, how do you gain that trust? Well, lots of ways, but there's two primary ways. Leaders earn trust through sacrificial service, and leaders earn trust by demonstrating competence. That's the two primary ways that you, you, you gain trust. Sacrificial service, that's the Bible way, and demonstrating competence where people have confidence in your leadership is the second way. Now, let's talk about the first one, sacrificial service. Again, I'm the state executive in the Northwest Baptist Convention, and a young pastor calls me and says, Dr. Forge, I understand you're a visionary leader, and I really uh, respect what you've accomplished, and I'd like to come and show you my vision for my church and give you, some, give you an opportunity to critique it. And I said, okay, great. This young pastor is in mid to late 20s, walks in my office and lays out his vision for his church. It's like in a little notebook he's put together. And he shows it to me. And when he finishes, I mean, my thought was, this is magnificent. Okay, this is fantastic. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, honestly, this is very good. I'm very impressed. He said, that's great. So my question for you then is, what should I do first? And I said, that's a great question. Here's the answer. Go home and marry and bury some people. Excuse me? I said, all right, let me speak slower. Go home and marry and bury some people. He said, Dr. I, I, I guess I'm just not following. I said, I know. I'm just, I'm just really messing with you if I get your attention. And now listen to me. I said, you, you, you're not even 30 years old yet and been a pastor of this church for less than two years. You've laid out a 20-year vision here for me, and it's fantastic. I, I really appreciate what you're trying to accomplish. And I believe you do it. But here's what you have to understand. When you lay this out, here's what your followers are going to hear. He wants me to give how much money? He wants me to give how much time? He wants me to do what with my life? For the next 20 years? And I said, here's the remarkable thing about God's people. They'll do it with you. They'll give hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. They'll give tens of thousands of hours. They'll do it with you. If they trust you. If they trust you. And I said, here's how you can earn their trust. You're going to go home and you're going to go to their weddings. And you're going to go to their funerals. And you're going to sit up with them at the night in the hospital. And you're going to counsel them when they're hurting in their marriages, when their kids are getting in trouble. You're going to care for them and serve them and demonstrate to them that you really are a person that, that they can trust with their deepest secrets and their most uh, painful experiences. And then here's what's going to happen. You're going to stand up in your church one Sunday and you're going to say, we've been working on this for the last year. The leadership and I are in complete unity. Here's where we believe we need to go in the next five years. And you're going to lay out the first part of your vision. And people are going to be listening to you, and this is what they're going to be deciding. Do I really trust him enough to make these kinds of sacrifices that he's asking of me? And this is what goes on in people's minds. Now, you're a leader. You may not think this way, but this is how your followers think. And believe it or not, this is how you think, too, about other people that you're following. This is what your followers think. You know, Brother Bob was with me when my mom died. He saw me 
cry my eyes out and lash out at my brother who's evil. And he saw me have to deal with my sister who's trying to steal the money. And he helped me through that. And he helped me understand how to handle my brother, how to deal with my sister, and how to handle the death of my mom and work through that whole mess. He met with me time after time after time. That's my pastor. And he believes God wants us to do this. I'm with him. I'm with him. That's, what, that's, that's how you get him. That's how you get him trust. It's through sacrificial service. People see you laying your life down for them, and then you ask them to lay their life down for the mission of God that you believe is, you've been called to lead to accomplish. They will do it for you if they trust you, right? Now, let's talk about this for a second, though, just a little bit off. I'm not sure you have this to go through. Let me just talk about this for a second. If you're a very young pastor, what I've been saying is sort of an illustration of how you gain trust. But let's suppose some of you guys have been at this for 25, 30 years like me. You have something called presumed confidence, or excuse me, presumed trust or presumed competence, as I'll talk about this moment. In other words, if you called me to be the leader of your organization, I've been doing this for 40 years, I have a track record. When I come, my followers are going to assume or presume that I have their, their trust and confidence. Okay? And so if you're a leader who's been leading for a long time, you can come into an organization and go faster than someone who's not been leading for a long time. Does that make sense? It's just, it's just intuitively obvious, isn't it? But it, it needs to be said, you can do that. Now, you can also lose that confidence and trust by bad decision making. But in the beginning, people will ask you to go faster because you've been doing this longer and they trust you more because of the track record of service you've laid down, not just in their lives, but in the lives of others. Okay, now about demonstrating confidence. Um, after I planted the church in Oregon, uh, <laughs> I uh, left to become a state executive, but for a lot of different reasons, we wanted to remain a member of the church we planted. Now, I know that's a little bit fraught with uh, some, some issues, but the pastor who came in after me was very open to us remaining in the church, and so we stayed. Uh, it was really helpful for my children. They were teenagers with no disruption in our family. In that regard, you, you get the idea. Well, our pastor served us for the first three years and made a series of remarkable, positive changes in our church. And every major decision that we had to make in those first three years, he made them well, and he demonstrated what? Competence. And then the big one came. You see, I had planted this church in 1989, and a part of our founding vision was that we would never own property. We would never own property. We were going to become a major church in a minor facility. We were going to maximize missions and church planting and giving ourselves away and always exist in rented uh, facilities. And we had agreed that we would never grow past 1,000 in attendance, but that when we reached 500 to 700, we would start training 200 people to leave and we'd start spinning off other congregations. We felt like that was a far better stewardship than trying to build a 10,000 attendance church in Oregon. Well, we had been working on that project for the first three to five, or the first few years of my pastor, the first six years, and then the new pastor came, and he had been leading us that way for about three years. And then, I don't have time for all this, but a series of things happened that were miraculous, unexpected, and led us to believe that God wanted us to build a home on our own facility. And it didn't change our core strategy about spinning off other churches, and the church right now is involved with two church plans in Oregon, so it's still doing that. But it, it uh, it didn't change our strategy that we would have a facility instead of rented facilities. And the pastor took me out to lunch. He said, uh, I'm at Red Robin. Do you have that restaurant here? I'm at Red Robin. I'm forking down a pasta salad. I'll never forget the details. Pastor says, Jeff, uh, I wanted to talk to you about some major decisions the leadership is making in the church. I said, I'm with you. He said, as you know, you led the church to establish in its DNA that you would never own property. Yes, I know that. And now, as you know, there's been a series of circumstances that have come about that we believe it's time to change that direction and actually own our own facility. And I said, I understand that. He said, we've agreed unanimously that we're going to go forward with this plan. I said, I'm right with you, Pastor. I'm supporting you 100% all the way. He said, well, then I have one other question for you. We're going to set aside a task force to build this new campus 
We're going to put some really competent people on it and let them do it separate from the ongoing ministry of the church so that we don't get distracted by a building, which is what we never want to do. And we're going to put some really sharp people on there, but in order to accomplish this, we need somebody to lead it that will really be able to have the confidence of the church and also the confidence of these fairly high-powered leaders that are putting on there. And I'm just working out hostile. And I said, that's exactly right. That plan will work. You can, you can do that. And he said, and we've, I've come there to ask you to chair the facilities task force to build a campus you said we never have. <laughs> and I remember pausing sort of in mid fight I put my fork down and I said, let me see if I got this straight. You want me to build the campus that, you, that I said we never have. He said, that's right. I just sat there looking at him and he said, Jeff, would you pray about this? I said, no. I will not pray about it. My answer is yes. Pastor, you're asking me to do something that's within my gift mix that I have the time and interest in doing. And I believe, based on the competent leadership you've given our church over these past three years, that you are leading us to do the right thing. I am with you, Pastor. I will do this with you. I went on an idea that I chaired the facilities task force for the next eight years. <laughs> but today, they have four buildings on a beautiful campus with 300 parking places, and uh, it's fantastic. Okay, and we did the whole thing. We built a building that was appraised at almost $7 million. Today, we moved in with only $800,000 to vote against it. So we felt like we came out pretty good at the end. We didn't quite have enough money at the end, but we managed to get it done. Now, I went home that night and I told my family this story. My 15-year-old son is there. He's a clone of me. Uh, and so he's thinking this story, you know, like I would have taken it. And when I got to the punchline, I said, and so Pastor asked me if I would do it. And my son said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, no, I'm not kidding you. He asked me to chair the task force. And my son laughed at me and said, well, what did you tell him? And I said, uh, well, I told him I would do it. And my son just instantly went serious and said, you, you're kidding me, Dad. I said, no, I'm not. And I said, I trust my pastor because of how he served us, but more importantly, because of the confidence he's demonstrated over these last three years. He's right, Casey. That's my son. He's right, Casey. And I'm going to help him build this property. Because I trust him. Make sense? Let me tell you the back side of that story. That, that was a profound night in, the, in our family. My son was 15, my daughter was 13, my other son was 11. The, the, all three children had a lot of questions about that decision, and we talked about that night. And that night, I said to both my sons, and I've said this to them many other times, but that night, again, I said, sons, you have two choices in your life. Either become pastors, or choose careers, where you can make the most money possible in the shortest amount of time possible and give the most of it away possible to a pastor whose vision you really have. And both of my sons are doing that today. They are incredibly generous and successful young men with pastors they believe in. My daughter married a pastor. They are not prosperous. They are not uh, successful in that regard. But you know what I'm talking about. Okay, they're normal. But uh, she married a pastor, so I guess that was a good thing, too. You know, when you believe in a pastor that you trust, it's amazing what people will do, isn't it? Do you understand what people will do when you ask them to fulfill the mission of God? They will ask and give you hundreds of hours of volunteer time and hundreds of thousands of dollars. They'll just give it. Why? Because you have convinced them that God wants, you to, wants them to help you do something, and they trust your spiritual judgment, your spiritual direction, and your spiritual leadership. And why do they trust you? Because you've served them, and you've demonstrated confidence to them. They will follow you. I'm always astounded that, that, that we don't, as leaders, reflect more on this. You do realize those three or four or five hundred people, or maybe even 30 or 40 or 50 people who come to hear you preach every Sunday could go anywhere. You do understand that, don't you? But they want to hear you. They can join anybody's church. They can join yours. They can be a supporting anybody's mission, but they believe in your mission and what you're trying to do to accomplish God's mission, right? Isn't that astounding to you? Do you ever reflect on that? No, a lot of times we think, and I know, I've been there, we kind of fall into the trap of thinking that 
that, that they're somehow dutiful or obligated and that they owe us this, but they don't. They follow us because they trust us. Okay, enough of that. I get kind of wound up with this, huh? But here's the part I don't hear talked about very much. And that is, not only must we earn trust, but what's the other side of it? We have to trust our followers. You know, in a, in a little while, we get to the end of these five questions, and one of the issues you have to decide is, are you willing to stay with it until they finish it, these followers of yours? Do you really trust them? Do you really trust them? It flows both ways, doesn't it? All right, let's move on. Number four, is the timing right for the change? Now, leaders often see the change, need for change, long before followers. That's normal. We have to learn to stay in step with God's timing, and that's the challenge we most often hear as leaders. Don't run ahead of God. Don't run ahead of people. Stay in step with God's timing, and I certainly believe that. As a leader, I have generally seen things sooner than others needed, others saw it, and I've needed to get to uh, solutions quicker than they were willing to get there. I get that. You have to slow down and move at God's pace to accomplish the purposes with people. But let me also say, you have to have the courage to move decisively when the time is right. The courage to move decisively when the time is right. Is the timing right for the change? You may see it a long time before others. You may have to pace yourself to stay in step with God's timing on the process. But then you have the courage to go when it's time. Two illustrations. A few years ago, in a western state, a church planter had some success and their church grew to the point where they were going to buy a small building. This small building was a, a, an office building that could be converted for church use. They saw it as a transitional property. They would be in there for maybe three to five years and they'd like to sell it on the other end. They put a committee together. They went out and made searches of options. They discovered this property. They came back. They reported it to the church and went through all the proper protocol, all the bylaw requirements, everything necessary to bring this matter before the church. They did so. In the context of the presentation, a person in the church was very negative about buying the building, and she made some very strong statements against buying the property. And her basic complaint was this young church could not afford to buy building. And the pastor listened to her complaints, moderated the meeting, and then said, I don't want to go forward with division, and so I'm going to not allow a vote tonight, and we'll come back and consider this in a future time. I have a good friend who was on that committee that went out and looked at that property. And he had told the pastor before the meeting, as a part of the process. I'm in a position where I can pay cash for this building for the church, but I won't do that. What I'd like for you to do is have a fundraising campaign in the church so that everyone has a part in the victory. Raise as much money as you can for the next, say, three to six months, and then I will pay the difference and we'll buy this building for cash. When the pastor allowed this woman to disrupt this process, my friend went to his pastor the next day and said, yesterday you lost my confidence. I do not believe you have the courage to be a pastor in this generation and to lead a church like this young one to be strong in the future. You knew that what this woman was saying was not true, and yet you would not stand up for what he decided to leave the church. He did not leave the vice he up quietly, but he left. But when a person like this leaves a smaller church, everyone is aware of what is happening. And unfortunately, what my friend did not know was that several other key people came to the pastor that same week independently and said, Pastor, you lost me on something. I, I, I can't invest my life in this if you're not going to stand up and do what's right. And within just a few weeks, that church, after three 
years of strong growth at the beginning, that church disbanded and is gone today. Why? Because when it's time to stand up, it's time to stand up. On April 1st, 2014, I stepped up in, the, I stepped up in front of the Gateway Seminary constituency. I had employees, the students, and many other interested parties there in that room that day. And I said, today, I have a major announcement about the future of Golden Gate Seminary. You can read the speech I gave. It's in an appendix to the back of your book. But I, I laid it out for you. That night before, I remember not sleeping much and praying a lot. And I remember praying a prayer something like this, God, tomorrow I'm putting it all on the line. I'm putting a seminary to Southern Baptist Convention at great risk. Now looking back on it, it was the greatest thing ever, but looking forward, we weren't sure how it was going to turn out, right? I didn't know that I was going to walk into a meeting and that I was going to have overwhelming support from the faculty and staff. I didn't know that God was going to pave the way as you read the book with miracle after miracle after miracle to give us property and gifts and resources and opportunities that we would never imagine. None of that was known that day. But someone had to step up that day and say, this is where we're going and this is what we're doing. And that someone had to be me. So is the timing right for the change? Sure. Don't run ahead of God. But when it's time, it's time. Step up and believe. Number four. At completion. Am I willing to see the change to completion? Am I willing to see the change to completion? Now, so many things about this. Uh, but going quickly, you must stay until the change is finished, and you must recognize when major change is really finished. Oh, sorry. When is that? Um... When is something really finished? Well, it's really finished when the new normal of establishing the mission of the, for which the change was made is being fulfilled. The new normal. Okay, let me illustrate that. I'll help you go faster. When we relocated the seminary, what is the seminary's mission? We shape leaders to expand God's kingdom around the world. That's our mission. So, when was the relocation complete? That's the question. Well, we announced the relocation on April 1st, 2014. We made the relocation during the month of June of 2016. And on July the 5th, 2016, we opened for business in our new location in Ontario, California. And then subsequently in our new location in Fremont, California. Two of our five campuses are new based on the relocation. When we opened, I spent the first month we were open basically as a public relations uh, person in the foyer of the new facility greeting guests who were coming through, saying hello, congratulations, all this kind of thing, and troubleshooting problems with the final move-in issues and those kinds of things. I cannot tell you how many people said this to me. Wow, Mr. President, I'll bet you're glad this is over. I'll bet you're glad this is behind you. Because you see, those people misunderstood our mission. They thought our mission was relocating the seminary. That wasn't our mission. So the relocation, meaning that we physically changed addresses, wasn't the end of the process, or the, wasn't the end of the major change. Now, I had recognized this sometime, sometime earlier, and so I'd taken our leadership team away about a year before, and I said to all our leadership team, I said, now listen, guys, and girls, I said, now listen, we're not going to have any time off in the summer of 2016. So I need you to start now, in early, in early 2015, or late 2014, I need you to start now pacing yourself. Because you need to preserve enough spiritual, emotional, and mental energy to last you from now until the summer of 2017. Because now listen to this. I said, because we will not accomplish the relocation until we have proven that we can fulfill our mission in our new location. And we will not have proven that until we complete a full academic year in our new iteration as Gateway Seminary. So the summer of 2016 when we relocated, that was just a pause or a comma in the process of the relocation. It really lasted until the following summer. Does that make sense? Have you ever 
denominational pastor can give you some studies on this. Have you ever noticed how many pastors resign a church after a major building program? Why is that? Because they think their mission was building a building. And when the building is finished, they're exhausted. That wasn't the mission. The mission is, the, the, the major change is we need a building to fulfill our mission. So when is the change finished? Is it finished at the groundbreaking or the ribbon cutting? Actually, not groundbreaking. The ribbon cutting ceremony or the dedication service? No. Here's when the mission, is, or when the major change is complete. The major change is complete when the new facility is being used effectively to fulfill the mission. That may take months, if not a year or two, until you're finally using it like you designed it for the accomplishment of the purpose. That's why leaders have to learn to pace themselves for what? When the new normal is really established, it's not the day of the ribbon cutting, it's the day that you can step back and say, wow, we're really using this building to do what we built it for. That's what we're doing. I would also want to say, but it's paid off, but that's another issue. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then you have to allocate emotional and spiritual energy for the duration of the project. Now, these are the five questions that I want. These are the five questions that we talked about this today. This is a again. Let's just okay. Sorry, I'm trying to get back to the five questions. These are the five questions. Is there changes in the mission? Is there shared urgency about the changes? Relational trust, time to say the changes. The time to change and willingness to changes to the vision. Remember how you use these. Quietly and privately in your devotions, work through these five questions. With your leadership team, deacons, elders, leadership team, how are you define it? Work through these five questions. When you get ready to talk with your church family, Use strategies out of these five questions. Use the outline of these five questions. Use these five questions to guide your presentation or your preparation for your church as a whole. But now watch this. When you are working through this privately and working through this with your leadership team, you can't go forward until you get five yeses. Five yeses. You say, well, it is essential, and there is shared urgency, and there is trust, but it just doesn't seem like the timing is right. You gotta wait, right? You gotta wait. Or you say, well, everything seems right, except I don't think the shared urgency is there. Well, you gotta work. You gotta work on that. Work toward five yeses. Okay?